Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh once said that if he was asked to mediate a conflict, he would take many people with him to listen to what was at issue. They would all listen, and then they would go away and talk about what they had heard. Once they all agreed, they would go back and report, this is what we heard, and ask, is this what you meant to say? Then they would listen to that response and repeat the process until both sides could say that they had been fully heard. Then negotiations could begin. No discussion of solutions could be entered into until everyone felt understood and, in the process, that trust had been achieved. As Mark said earlier, our message today is about communication, how we succeed and more often realize where gaps in understanding affect how we interact with each other. George Bernard Shaw is famous for his irascible nature, and it may be contrarian of me, but I find it a personality trait that's very endearing. I hope to be occasionally irascible as I get older. I think the elderly can get away with it and still be taken seriously. I deeply admire Shaw for two things in addition to his writing. One, he was awarded a Nobel Prize for the body of his work, and he accepted the honor, but he refused the money. Secondly, Shaw advocated for women's rights and income equality, and remember, this was in the 1920s. Shaw had that gift for summing up an entire argument in a few well-chosen words. The single biggest problem of communication is the illusion that it has taken place. This is evident in any report of what is happening in our world. Words are the vehicle for imparting chaos and fear. They are reported rightly and wrongly, and not for the purpose of clarity, but for swaying opinion and belief. In a world in which fact-checking comes even down to our daily conversation, and I don't know about you, but the day I became aware that Google had become a verb felt both ridiculous and powerful. No more yes it is, no it isn't, conversations with my brother, ever Google it. The quotation from Shaw is one that I'm aware of every single day. You know that I'm a hospital chaplain, where, and where is clear, concise communication more important than in medical care and maybe rocket science? In fact, there's an entire department in the hospital in which I work called Com Skills, which creates opportunities for medical staff in training to learn how to talk to patients and their families with precision and kindness, and to recognize when medical jargon is more obstructive than helpful. It's not a topic covered in medical school, and it's a skill that improves with practice and conscious application of a few tools that we can all use. How we consciously work with that knowledge that communication is really what we mean is a lot harder than it looks, as evidenced by our own telephone game today. I first became aware of the power of words, and I remember it clearly to this very minute, when I was eight years old. My younger cousin Beth and I were playing on our grandfather's farm. We had specific boundaries that we had to stay inside, and yet it was a hot day, and we just wanted to put our feet in the cool water of the pond next to the dam that my grandfather had built. When we got back, we both got in trouble for going outside the range of our mother's ability to call us and for going near the dam and the deep water of the pool without an adult present. As punishment, my mother told me that if we couldn't listen, then we couldn't play together anymore that day. And what I said to Beth was, 
My mother said, I can't play with you. And her face crumpled and she ran away crying. I was horrified and shocked that something that I said could have that kind of effect on another person. My words caused immense pain and built a wall between my cousin and me. For me, it was one of those pivotal moments of childhood. You can hear how I've dissected it and how it's remained a part of my consciousness. Please know that I've apologized to Beth many times since then. The impact of my words at that young age continues to be a part of how I decide what to say and how to talk to others, even 60 odd years later. What are the many ways in our lives in which we use words, consciously and unconsciously, to actually block communication with others? And how can we instead learn to use our world, our words to build bridges instead of throwing up walls while still remaining true to ourselves and maintaining our own integrity, even in the face of opposition and conflict? When does yes mean I hear you and not I agree? And when is no abandonment instead of a simple referral, excuse me, instead of a simple refusal. We can use the power of language to further our relationships and extend dialogue with each other, even when we have differing points of view. I'm very proud to be a Unitarian Universalist because we value hearing and being heard. Our recent congregational meeting lasted less than 90 minutes, which is something of a UU miracle for us. Every voice was heard and every question answered, and it's because our congregational leaders took the time beforehand in preparation to be sure that everyone had the details, that the process was transparent, and that every possible angle had been explored and addressed in advance. They communicated clearly with all of us, and the result was clear. Building bridges, not walls, of course, evokes images of a particular political content these days, but let us today follow a different path, a path toward building communication between people who may believe differently have different agendas, have different frames of reference even, both culturally and practically. Communication is, in fact, a two-way street. Listening is as important as what is said. As a person who is aging and perhaps doesn't hear as well as I once did, I often say, and only half joking, that the older I get, the stranger the things that people say to me. Aging has a way of teaching me to be less prideful and more humble. Asking for clarification is something I'm getting a little better at, as well as admitting not to remember people's names and details of plans or meetings. I'm learning to carry my phone in my back pocket like everybody else. Sometimes, despite our best intentions, we may not have heard the same thing that was said. As DJ said when we were talking about the service today, it could be especially interesting to see if anyone took the time to say, sorry, what did you say? Can you repeat that one more time? And if not, why not? It's a major focus of chaplains to consider what to say in response to our patients' words, both positive and not so positive, and to keep the focus on what was said, not adding to it or changing the perspective. To speak always with kindness and to weigh carefully what was said and then to repeat back what you think you heard and say, 
tell me. And then listen, always listen. You know the most common complaint that people have about their doctors is that they don't take the time to listen to their patients. And even if you understand the constraints on the doctor's time, it doesn't help you if you don't feel heard. And that feels frightening, frightening like you've been left out to do it and find out and figure it out for yourself. You won't be surprised to know that doctors worry about this too. And that's why we now have interdisciplinary teams to help with the complexities of medical information. The coordination that goes on behind the scenes in doing just what Thich Nhat Hanh described is intense. I invite you to share in an experiment. I won't call it homework, it's the end of July. For the next few days, try eliminating the words no, can't, won't, but, and don't from your vocabulary. Instead, rephrase your words and reframe your thinking to say what you can do in a given situation and what you will do based on what you believe is right and true and what you have heard. No is a wall. It puts a barrier between you and me. It is a hard stop. We can have differing opinions and thoughts and ideals and stay at the table until we understand each other's perspective and have a shared plan to go forward, heard, understood, and respected. How much difference can that make in our lives? We will not abandon each other with misunderstandings and unsolved crises. Say what you can do. Choose to lower anxiety, ease frustration, and continue to build the beloved community. I leave you this morning with a bit of whimsy from Gertrude Stein. Which I wish to say is this. There is no beginning to an end, but there is a beginning to an end to beginning. Why, yes, of course. And one can learn that north, of course, is not only north, but north as north. Why were we worried? What I wish to say is this. Yes, of course. May it be so. And amen. <laughs>